Good afternoon, everyone. Um, last year, um, around this time actually, I was in the Philippines um, for about a week on a school-led community service trip. And I remember on the long bus ride from the airport, I watched a movie. Now, I, I couldn't actually hear anything that was being said because the volume had been turned all the way down, but the images spoke loudly enough. Um, it was an early 2000s movie, Hollywood, and it featured an African-American male um, just um, being the actual embodiment of so many stereotypes about African-American men. So he was dancing across the screen and playing basketball, and at some point in time he went to prison and then broke out of prison, etc. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, what a typical man, what a typical black man. And as I heard myself think those thoughts, a wave of shock came over me. Stereotyping, generalizing, these are things that I am actually so personally, passionately against, and yet there I was, stereotyping and generalizing. But more so, that was a eureka moment for me because it was what inspired me to write a compendium of poems that I'll be presenting to the school community um, in April um, on the subject matter of stereotyping, generalizing, and the negative effects thereof. And in the words of Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the danger of the single story. Um, it's also why I'm here talking to you today. In that moment, I asked myself that if that simple negative image is what I had defined within myself as the typical black man, then how did that affect how I saw my brothers? What did that mean about how I saw my uncles, my cousins, my friends, my people, myself? And ladies and gentlemen, that's what I'm here to discuss today. You see, negative stereotypes as constructed, perpetuated by the media, they don't just affect the way the masses view marginalized groups within society. They affect the ways that we, members of these marginalized groups, grow to view ourselves, the liberties, the limitations that we give ourselves. And to address this matter, I think I should tell you a bit about my context. Um, so my name is Oluwato Milayo Oreni Keji Madariko, or Tomi Madariko for short. Um, I was born in England, as already said, and um, I lived there until I was four, and I moved back with my family um, to my home country, Nigeria. Um, and moving back came with a number of challenges on a more personal level. Uh, I remember that myself, my brothers, we were teased by a number of our peers at school because of our distinctly British accents. I still have a bit of a trace of it, not as much now as before. And it's interesting how at that age I was so teased, but teachers, adults, people in places of authority would just smile when I spoke, when my brothers spoke. It was so endearing, you know? And what I found surprising was how much my accent to them made me more privileged. Um, it made me seem more delicate, more sophisticated. The notion that they had that I hate the most was that my accent made me seem somewhat more intelligent. And so how does this affect little Nigerian children, you might ask? Why is this such an issue? It's because, for example, when two children have gone home and memorized and practiced a poem just as much as one, of another, as, as one another. And then they come back and present that to the class in the hopes that they can both be entered into the school poetry competition. And yet one of them is turned down because the girl with the British accent, quote unquote, because the teacher actually said this, sounds more intelligent. That instills within them the mentality, both of those children, the mentality that what is of the West is what is best that a Nigerian accent or Nigerian manner, Nigerian practices, Nigerian context will never be comparable to an English. And in a country where English is the official language, therefore that somewhat insinuates that a Nigerian expressing themselves with a Nigerian accent may never be viewed as someone with as high a status or with as much to offer 
as one who speaks with an English accent. You see, this post-colonial mentality is one that manifests itself in so many ways. That is just one of the examples. And while we are no longer, Nigeria that is, a physical colony of Britain, many Nigerians, many Africans, are having their minds, in my opinion, colonized by the media today. Now, of course, I can't directly say that without taking into account the fact that colonization is not something that one can just throw out there as being recreated because of a few media biases and assumptions. Of course not. The effects of colonization are too great to quantify, and I won't simplify them as such. Also, people can argue that what is happening today with the media and portrayals are, at, are as an effect of the hierarchy, the racial hierarchy that has been embedded within so many post-colonial nation societies as an effect of colonization. But what I'm here to discuss are the negative images and their effects on members of marginalized groups like myself. More often than not, blacks are portrayed as dangerous or servile, uneducated or unattractive in a lot of Western media. And the thing is, the, it, that doesn't just affect the way we are portrayed in other countries. Because if you take Nigeria, for example, where I come from, on the radio, on the television, on the internet, these are the images that we see, these are the shows that we watch, the movies that we watch. Hollywood is not something that is lost or trapped or boxed into the United States, for example. It's something that transcends borders of countries. Look at the images that we have of Africa in the media. I've always had a hard time associating the images of abject poverty, of violence that the media sells of Africa with my home in Nigeria. And that, of course, can be attributed to the fact that, I won't lie, I am privileged, not just as a Nigerian, not just as a black person or an African, but as a human being. I'm grateful to God for all of the things that I have. And the fact that I haven't been exposed to war, to poverty, to famine, a lot of the things that unfortunately many people have to deal with, many people suffer today, tomorrow, yesterday. But my problem with the way the media portrays Africa, it's not misrepresentation. I have a problem with under-representation. Africa is a big continent. There are more than 50 countries, but it is so often generalized that you have even figures within politics, such as Joe Biden, referring to the whole of Africa as one country. Look at the 1980 song by the band Band-Aid. It was titled, Do They Know It's Christmas? And it was written or performed in response to um, famine in Ethiopia. And yet the whole song is addressed to the whole continent of Africa with degrading lines such as, nothing ever grows, it never snows, the only water that ever flows are their tears. In Africa, do they know it's Christmas time at all? How does that make me feel? I mean, first of all, these are straight up fallacies. It's just wrong. Africa is a continent that has so many different climatic regions. You have tropical climates such as that which exists within Nigeria. You have the desert, you have the savanna. So generalizing and just giving straight up incorrect facts or assertions is just plain unfair. And that's just one way in which Africa is underrepresented and misrepresented. Another is that a lot of Western television shows and Hollywood movies don't, in my opinion, often enough feature distinctly African characters and cast members. A lot of the time, the closest that we black Africans get to having Africans in these movies and TV shows is African-American actors or Afro-British actors and actresses. And so how does that affect us? Well, as a youth, I can tell you for free that growing up, watching television shows, watch, listening to music, we so often see characters that we have a lot in common with as those that we can emulate more than others. So things like age, ethnicity, the people that we see, the images of people that we see, that we feel we have something in common with, become our role models. I remember, for example, that I loved Hannah Montana. 
But I always found Raven from That's So Raven somewhat more relatable for me. I find that so many of my peers back home in Nigeria, especially the boys, enjoy adopting aspects of African-American hip-hop culture, especially, as portrayed by the media. I want to some of the negative effects of this. The fact that a lot of the time, these images that are associated with aspects of that culture are very negative. You see young black men on television shows being abusive, aggressive, images of aggression, men committing acts such as theft, criminals are what is shown on television. You have men beating women, black men I'm referring to. What does that make young men view as acceptable, as worthy of emulation? What do they therefore aspire to become? Or look at the images that we have of young black women. You see, I come from, as I said, Nigeria. Most of us are black, many of us are like my skin tone, but of course there's a wide range. You have people significantly lighter than me, people rather darker than me. And so, when I watch television shows or when I see music videos and the women who are deemed as beautiful are significantly lighter than me, then maybe if I didn't have a mother who affirms me constantly that I am beautiful and that I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be proud of who I am because of what I have to offer and not because of the color of my skin, then maybe I would have been many of the women buying bleaching creams today because they feel as if they are not beautiful enough as black women, as dark women. Dark women in television shows a lot of the time in Western media, especially um, shows from the United States, even those specifically meant to empower African Americans, feature dark-skinned women as less attractive, less desirable, aggressive, angry. They've been dealt the bad hand of society. So I've told you about the effects on one who looks at these uh, and looks at the media for images that they, they feel they can relate to and um, for characters that perhaps they can emulate. But what happens when one doesn't adhere to certain stereotypes? And by speaking with the accent that I do and dressing the way that I do, by being able to relate to aspects of more than one culture in the way that I have, I've been nothing but myself for my whole life. But to too many people, I've always been different. I've been an exception to the norm. It's incredibly unfortunate the number of times that someone has walked up to me and said, you're not black enough. And what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it strongly suggests. It suggests that I'm not angry enough or that I'm not poor enough. It suggests that maybe I'm too confident or I'm not enough of a replica of a dark-skinned African-American female as negatively portrayed in way too many Tyler Perry movies. You don't sound black enough. You don't sound African enough. You are an Oreo. You're not really African. And all of these translate to you aren't Cookie from Empire, nor are you Eddie Murphy from Coming to America, or maybe even Lupita Nyong'o from 12 Years a Slave. You see, a lot of the images that the media sells, as I've tried to illustrate, are negative, overly simplified, generalizing. And education, of course, is what enables us to see through these constructions and protest allowing them to remain the status quo. But my sadness lies in the fact that the media is also a mirror, in that it reflects what society actually believes, what people think, the notions that they have, and what that means to me is that we are very far from achieving equality and open-mindedness. And that is why people like me, Africans, Blacks, dark-skinned women, are portrayed in the ways that we so often are. So members of society, I look to you today, and I have a few questions. Why do we always feel the need to put labels on everything and everyone? Do we not realize that when we do such so simplistically, we ignore the individuality, originality, complexities, and even contradictions that lie within ourselves as unique human beings. 
My talk today is a call for all of us to not allow our minds to be soil fertile for seeds of underrepresentation, misrepresentation, and the effects thereof to be sown by the media. Because these seeds germinate into negative, preconceived notions and therefore impose limitations on our own ability to reason independently. So please, let us make blank pages of our minds today. Because that is the only way that we can truly see ourselves in the ways that, in, in the ways that we actually are. And not with the two-dimensional character traits that the media has assigned us on the basis of our skin tone or our gender, our socioeconomic status, our belief systems, etc. Because only then will we truly be in charge of our present and our identities, but also our future and our destinies. And thank you very much. <laughs>